We are the team of mediators for Science Gallery Atlanta. We are scientists, trailblazers, storytellers, seekers, questioners. We are artists. We are Emory University students. And we are here to invite you to join us, to gain courage, use your voice, and express yourself without judgment. Because when you do, energy is activated and an upsurge in creativity is transferred. What can happen if you access new ways of thinking and expressing? At Science Gallery Atlanta, we are using virtual experiences and engagement to connect and see how we can open up and help us all cope and set the tone for the rest of the day, the rest of the year, and maybe the rest of our lives. Let's be, let's act, because our ability to improve conditions happens when we come together. Hello, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. My name is Sophie and I'm a student at Emory University as well as a student mediator for Science Gallery Atlanta. We at Science Gallery Atlanta are hosting a virtual series about coping mechanisms during this difficult time in the world. Today we will be discussing the power music has on our mental health. I am thrilled to be joined by Gary Motley, Dion Liverpool, and Dr. Stephen Levy today to have this discussion. Could you please introduce yourselves? I'm Steve Levy. I've been an Emory professor for 47 years. I'm a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst and a lifelong amateur musician. I play winds and for the last 50 years, violin. I'm Gary Motley. I'm a professor of performance and founding director of jazz studies at Emory University. I have been at Emory for 25 years. Uh, I've worked in the, the music industry as a performer, composer, and arranger and also involved in music education uh, in various capacities from, uh, from uh, teaching to uh, outreach programs. Hi, my name is Dion Liverpool. I'm an artist affiliate originally from Canada, and I teach hip hop composition at Emory University, and I've been at Emory for about a year. Great, thank you guys. Um, so this is a question for all of you. Um, in your personal life, what has music provided you in terms of mental health or your ability to cope with difficult situations? Um, I'll start us off with that. Uh, music has been a significant part of my life. I can't remember a time when um, when music was not a part of my life. And growing up at home in our house, you had a choice. You could either play piano or uh, sing. And I always told people I elected to keep my mouth shut. Um, there was always music. Um, and after a while, it just became this, it was like an escape, this way of, of um, being able to just connect with a different thing or even separate from 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 some of the angst uh, of the world. And for me, being very young, it was a wonderful place to just get lost in my imagination. Jump in because I have some commonalities and some striking differences. Uh, certainly music has been a part of my life uh, and remains a part of my life every day since as long as I can remember. Although there was no one in my home uh, who was musical and music wasn't a part of my home. And so that many of the early memories I have about music uh, was that it was an opportunity for me to escape from the rest of my family and to have a private sensual world uh, that no one could join. Um, certainly for the rest of my life, it has remained a, a, a source of self-soothing uh, and reflection and maintains a certain degree of escape escapism, um, but, you know, increasingly a more pleasurable one, although it is probably for all of us taken on all sorts of other meanings as well, of prowess, of, of privacy, of, of soothing. Um, but I, I can't imagine a day without music. For me, um, I, I grew up in a Trinidadian household, so music and Calypso and Soko was a very big part of upbringing, uh, whether it was during Christmas or other holidays, carnival. Um, my, my background is definitely different. I grew up in um, eight different countries. My father worked for an oil company. So um, every two years we would move to different countries. So a lot of times my sister and I were typically the only like um, uh, people of African descent in these schools or one of four maybe. And so music, the musical differences between us and other students was very was very vast because they were listening to like hard rock and things like that alternative. Whereas I was more interested in like more of 
the rap hip hop beats only because I identify with it from a cultural standpoint. So it wasn't so much uh, escapism for me, but it was almost like it helped me build my identity um, of of where my people came from. Um, it, it gave me reassurance as an individual because I, I knew there was something special about the music, even though nobody else was listening to it. For me, it was like, it just gave me like that centering when I was like, this is very interesting. These rhythms, these beats really kind of resonate with me. I want to explore those further. And it happened subconsciously at the age of nine, 10, 10 years old, but I never kind of strayed away from that thought process. What's interesting to, to me as, as a psychoanalyst is the various meanings that musicians uh, and, and everyone gives to music. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned identity. I, you know, for sure, growing up, I was a band geek. Uh, that's how I thought of myself. And mm -hmm. that's who my friends were. Um, prowess became important. Uh, this was something I could do that other people couldn't do. Right. Um, and I think lots of self-esteem was built around being good at it. And interestingly, since I'm twice as old as any of you guys, I'm almost 76. Congratulations. Uh, I very actively struggle these days with, with worries about the decrease in, in coordination and dexterity and prowess. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be able to play for hours and hours and hours, and um, I can't do that anymore because of arthritis. Mm -hmm. uh, and my trills are slower and my vibrato is less even than it used to be. And uh, I anticipate what the, the loss of the, the ease of entering into that private world is like uh, as one mm -hmm. gets older. You know, I can't imagine losing it. Uh, and I often think about the, the sort of change from performing and playing to just listening because mm -hmm. that time will, that time yeah. will come. And how I'll negotiate that and what the losses associated with that are likely to be. Yeah, it's very interesting you say say that because um, even in this time during COVID-19, for me not to be able to be, um, as much as I don't miss DJing at, at clubs and, and places where people dance because of like, you know, drunk people and smoke, I do miss the interaction. I do miss the challenge of mm -hmm. playing music and figuring out how to make people move. And I'm, it's funny you say what you said, because I thought yesterday, I was like, wow, what if I lose that ability or if, how fine tuned it was and to be able to identify what songs to play for people. And I really, it really bothered me yesterday because I was like, I may never get that back or have the opportunity to do it the way I did it before. And it is, it, it does give a little sense of like, not depression, but it does make me a little sad thinking that what I did before for the past 30 years of my life, I may not be able to ever do in that capacity again. Yeah, a lot of yeah, a lot of the musicians that I work with, that's what we're all kind of facing right now. This is not something it it's something um as you say you think about it as you get older, you don't think that in, there will ever be a situation in society where something occurs that just all of a sudden like within 24 hours you're not able to to do this anymore. You're not able to get out and interact with people. And so we find ourselves now um uh, creating music online. And that was one of my challenges with my program is trying to figure out how to get musicians to be able to interact with each other. And you don't have that connection and that spontaneity, you know, spontaneity that you had before. And yet we still have this, this need as humans to, to connect to each other. And, and you know, how, how do we do that? And, you know, in a way it's kind of redefining what, what, what role does music play in our lives and what significance does it have now that we're having to do it th through these, um, I hate to use the term artificial mediums, but that it's pretty much is what it, what it is, you know? Yeah, for sure. When, when I think about the, the psychological origins of music, you know, being a psychoanalyst, I regularly turn to early development and, you know, I think that that the experience that musicians have of music is, is rooted in the very earliest mother and mother child, mother baby, really, uh, rhythmic sounds and nonverbal communications and rocking um, and soothing. And the idea that one, if, if someone is a musician or a lover of music, you always have that and have easy access to it. 
Uh, it's something that you often interpersonally, it's much harder to have easy access to, but you can always make music in your head. You can always listen to music. Um, and the, that capacity to make oneself feel better, which I think is rooted in, in those very early experiences, partially in the biology of it, but I think mainly in, in the meaning one attributes to it, that the threat of losing that or it being interfered with is an enormous threat, I think. Mm -hmm. and I certainly experienced that. Uh, I miss you know, playing with my quartet and playing with my pianist. We tried it once over Zoom. It, it just didn't, you know, I, I had trouble feeling it. Sure. Yeah. I have been preoccupied with mastering a, a, a Bach unaccompanied um, piece that's very demanding. And there's a, a certain element of, I can do this, that mm -hmm. I think has to do with getting over uh, and reassuring myself that we can get through this, that I can, I can master this, you know, three part fugue that's terribly difficult to master um, and can't let it go. And have in fact been surprised that I, I don't turn to pieces that are easy and soothing and relaxing. In fact, there's a, a certain element of, I can get through this, that, mm -hmm. that I feel in, in, my, in my playing. Interesting. What are ways that you think non-musicians can use music as a way to cope with these difficult times? I think it's always been that for people. Music does have its own definition in people's lives and how they utilize it. And I think people, like having to sit down and just be in one place and be still kind of causes you to really be introspective and think about your choices and what's going mm -hmm. on. And yeah. it, it allows you, it's allowed me more time to just really just sit down and just be for a second, you know, and not be anxious at just being, because I think if it was just me isolated and in this situation, I would feel very like alienated from everybody. But since we're all going through this, there is a, there is community in that too. You know, there is, um, solace in that you can um, reflect on music with your friends and you can get together virtually and um, talk. I like uh, people don't really talk that much. The art of conversation, you know, this whole notion of sitting down, uh, you know, physically face to face, if we can do it, but at least now virtually uh, face to face. And it's interesting, uh, even when you're teaching online, sometimes and you're wanting to get a response from students and you kind of get this deadpan thing and it's like, okay, am I, am I really getting through? And so I think it is forcing us to get back to that, that art um, of, of conversation. 20, 30 years ago, I was in a foreign country, sat down with three other string players to play string quartets. I did not speak the same language so that none of us could speak to each other. Mm -hmm. And we shared the most sort of intimate exchange and communication in, a, in the private language of music that we all shared, mm -hmm. even though we couldn't talk to each other. Sure. I've been wondering sort of, why is this memory in my mind? <laughs> I think, you know, you, you know, I treat patients on the telephone. I teach my courses on Zoom, which is very challenging to say the least. Uh, it's interesting, we all can communicate communicate well because I think we share this musical experience mm -hmm. in some way. Uh, but this memory of playing quartets and sharing the most intimate sorts of feelings in our private language, I think reflects how much I miss that in everyday life, you know, sure. with what yeah. we're going through. To me, music is like water. It can get through anything. It can f take any shape, any form, and it can just exist in any way it wants to exist. And I think that's a very powerful tool. I think partly it's because it was put into us in the same way for all of us, regardless of what the rest of our experiences mm -hmm. in life were. Mm -hmm. We all had that same origin of, of soothing and connection and rhythm and touch and yeah. sensory experience. Um, Absolutely. If anybody's going to be impacted by what's going on right now, it's going to be you and your generation. Exactly. And um, the message that I'd like to send to you is don't give up. Uh, always have hope. You know, we, these challenges come up and we, we don't expect these things. But, but our, um, our true spirit um, is to believe and know that, that we can get through these things. And you need to know that we are constantly working to find solutions 
so that we can improve and and uh, leave this place in a better condition than we found it uh, and to continue to pave a way for you guys so definitely uh, please know that we're out there working and doing our best for you hi i'm jenna heaton and i'm the science gallery atlanta project manager and i'm co-producing along with the student mediators the connecting cope series the conversation between Sophie, Dion, Gary, and Steven was only supposed to be 15 minutes, but they ended up talking for over 45 minutes. Not just because of the topic, but because they were all centered and present in conversation. Something that I think we're all craving at the moment. Sustained hardship, whatever form it may take, can take a toll on our mental health. So you and I are gonna do something together, right now. There are two main properties of a regular vibration, amplitude, and the frequency, which affect the way it sounds. Frequency is the speed of the vibration, and this determines the pitch of the sound. It is measured by the number of wave cycles that occur in one second, and its measurement is called hertz. The Sophageo frequencies contain six pure tonal notes that were once used to make up the ancient musical scale. One of the frequencies, 417 hertz, can help undo situations and facilitate change. I'm sure you're wondering how. Well, we store life experiences as energy patterns in our energy anatomy. Some of those experiences, especially the negative ones, they create blockages, interrupting the free flow of energy in our lives. When energy flows freely, new choices in our lives are awakened, and we have new found energy from within to make the changes we want and perhaps need to make. When we consciously listen to the 417 hertz frequency, it can be healing for the human body and soul. So let's do it, only for 30 seconds. Let's sit back in our chairs, stop everything else that we're doing, and consciously listen to the sound. What energy do you feel?